Yo, what's going on? It's Johnny King with another episode of the Becoming Kings podcast. I have my good buddy here in the quote unquote studio, the virtual studio in his studio and mine, Micah Buck. What's up, man? How are you? Hey, dude, I'm doing good. Glad to be here. Glad to be on the show for you. Yeah, it's always funny when I press record as if we haven't just spent all morning together uh, in the <laughs> right? coffee shop talking <laughs> crypto. So, but uh, all of a sudden you, you press record and then we're supposed to be like, you know, pretending like we're we're just talking for the first time today. So, right. anyways, man, I'm I'm excited to to get into your story and and all that stuff. But uh, for those of you that are listening, uh, you may not be uh, familiar with crypto and investing in crypto, or you might be very very familiar. Uh, Micah is 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 a dangerous man in many different ways, uh, <clears throat> and one of them is just his. Uh, his curiosity towards a multitude of uh, various facets of life. And crypto is one of those things that, you know, again, it go, I think it goes to, to show like the, the heart that you have. Cause you just spent like literally two hours with me in the coffee shop, walking me through how to fucking just, you know, get started, which is, Oh man, it's, it's confusing. It's overwhelming, but I appreciate <laughs> you, man, so much. Yeah, sure. It's awesome. So tell, tell those that are uh, listeners and our viewers here on YouTube, whichever, uh, a little bit more about yourself. Obviously, you're right here in Denver, Colorado, but tell a little bit more about your your background and your uh, defense contracting and consulting and everything else you got going on. Yeah, yeah. So um, after high school, went pretty much right into the Marine Corps. Uh, and then from the Marine Corps, because um, my background with uh, culinary arts and everything, that's actually what I went into the Marine Corps first for was to be a presidential chef. <laughs> so that happened. And I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to learn how to cook stuff even better than what I know how now from my parents. So I learned that. Um, then at the same time, I reclassed uh, into being what's called a parachute rigger. And that is a special operations uh, tier kind of within the Marine Corps. Um, we get tasked out to uh, essentially pack a bunch of different types of parachutes from free fall halo parachutes uh, to cargo parachutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then after the Marine Corps career that I had, uh, I went into personal training, being a master trainer, nutritionist, human physiologist, and kinesiologist. And at the same yep. time, um, I was studying uh, gunsmithing and learning how to deal with firearms. So that's what I'm in now. I have my own FFL uh, for doing custom guns and custom ARs, builds, stuff like that. So that's kind of the big background of that part. And then within all of that is when I started noticing the trend within mental health. And that's my true passion right now. Mm, so it's to helping guys so out. Yeah. Um, helping guys out with mental health issues, helping uh, women out that have gone through DV cases as well, because I'm actually, not a lot of people actually know this, um, but I'm actually a DV survivor. So I had a previous girlfriend of mine that actually went on ahead and, um, uh, did some assault and battery stuff, uh, actually to me. And so like, I know how it is firsthand actually going through that. And, uh, a lot of other things, uh, kind of came out from that and she's now long and gone and I'm trying to, you know, help out others so they don't go through the same stuff. Did you say DV as in David Victor, David Victor, like domestic violence, domestic violence. Thank you. Yeah. I'm like, I should yeah. know what that is. And I'm drawing a blank. Cool. <laughs> no, um, <I'm> <laughs> Very, very cool. Well, that's, that's a, again, a, a multitude of things that we could certainly talk about. You said you were, were you rigging parachutes? Yeah. So oh. rigging parachutes is a uh, packing parachute. So you have to right. one string them out a certain way. Um, you have to do what is called as a four line check. So checking the four primary lines of the parachute system. Yeah. Then from there uh, you have to pretty much fold every single one of the uh, parachute gores and the um, I can't remember all the, nomenclature for this because it's been like 15 years you know but uh laying the parachute out and fold it all nice and pretty and then you have to fold yeah. it again and pack it up into the uh, uh deployment bags so yeah cool 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 making sure that it obviously comes out of your pack correctly and you don't oh totally fuck things up yeah. yeah. I mean, we fucked with some people, you know, here and there and our own guys. I'm like, hey, dude, you're a, your shoes got a, a weight in it. Like, what the hell? Or what in the world? And like, we'd carry a weight out, a weight around, like, with us in our pocket, like, as we're checking the parachutes. So we're just like, oh my gosh, man, like, how did this get in here? Oh my gosh, let me check your stuff and freak them out. And they're like, oh man, geez. Okay. So yeah, that totally happens in the parachute rigging community as well as in the Marine Corps, especially in the Marine Corps, because you know how we are, a bunch of Marines, we always like to fuck with each other. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's that's dangerous and scary and not really dangerous, but uh, as long as you're really not fucking with them, but mm-hmm. you know, a, a scary prank. Did you yeah, ever see that? Uh, probably like ten years ago, those two dudes I felt like that went viral on uh, YouTube who were doing pranks on each other, and one of them, <clears throat> one of his next escalated prank on his buddy was that he was going skydiving and tandem right Ooh, but they okay. told him he was the one who was supposed to pull the rip cord and he pulls what? it but it was a false rip cord so he pulled it and then he's holding it you and know it's just flying. A string. <laughs> yeah there's they're flying he's like ah oh, he's freaking out and then uh-huh. when, when they finally <clears throat> land they land on a big freaking like cut out you know, picture that's of, of his buddy's face, like, ha ha, got you or whatever. That's um, awesome. I'll tell yeah, that that up. Be a pretty scary one. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't know. I actually didn't know about the whole culinary uh, angle. That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. So I, so you I, love cook, I love the cook. You want to be a, a chef for presidents. Yeah. So the only, yeah, exactly. The only people that are allowed to cook for the president of the military essentially are Marines. So you have Marine Corps chefs that go and be presidential chefs um, from that. So they're culinary arts specialists and they can get tasked out anywhere. And then they what's called a B billet and they go into another classification of um, their own ML- MOS. So military occupational specialty is their code. Uh, you know, with uh, it. And they go into being a presidential chef and, you know, Marines, the only ones that uh, guard embassies and guard the president too. So we're, we're uh, the Royal badasses of the, uh, Marine Corps and uh, of course the armed forces and you know we we like to claim that. <laughs> That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Where did your where did your love for culinary arts begin? Like with mom or dad or grandma or? Wow, uh, dude, all all the above, bro. All of it. Really? So my grandma, my nona, uh, Italian. She loves cooking. She loved cooking. She's passed now, bless her heart. Um, but she made the best best cannolis ever and like i've always tried to remake them ever since then it's like nah it just doesn't work you know i'm like i I just gotta remember my grandma's you know the way she does it all with so much love and care and it's just that italian you know grandma you know type of piece you know energy going into it just feels amazing so but yeah it was from her and then also my parents too so my parents love to cook uh my dad uh, helped out with a lot of restaurants when he was younger because of my uh, parents on his side grandparents on his side and then uh, of course my mom too so yeah, it was just natural for me to pick it up. And now I just cook whenever I can. I love to entertain and have people over and cook for them and make charcuterie that's boards cool. and have great wine pairings with it. Oh, yeah, that's my stuff. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Your your grandmother, was that uh, your dad's mom or your mom's mom? Uh, dad's mom. Yeah, the Italian your side. Dad's mom. So, you're, so your dad's Italian. What was what's, what's your heritage on your mom's side? Uh, she is, um, gosh, was it like? Swedish or Scandinavian Viking, I think it is, and then partially English, and then slightly German. So you got a little bit of everything in the European part of it, but it really is uh, the English and then like the Scandinavian, you know, Viking side. So you know, Italian Viking is what I call it. Yeah, right. I love it. Well, that's very very cool. So you so you obviously love uh, love doing the cooking part, but what what made you shift while you're serving from doing that to doing more of the the rigging to like what was what was that <clears throat> emotional journey while you were serving to take you from what your thought was to become a presidential chef to not doing that um at that time it was me wanting to do something more and more exhilarating i was like all right cool i've learned what i can with um doing the culinary arts uh piece for it and then after that i was like all right what else can i do and I wanted to do something more exhilarating, more adrenaline rush. I was like, wait a second, what do you guys do exactly? And one of the guys the recruiting it was like, hey, we're uh, you can do reclasses or a lat move um, and to be in a parachute rigger. And I was like, what is that? It was like, well, you pretty much jump out of planes, you pack parachutes. And I was like, mm-hmm. sign me up, let's go. So, yeah. and then after that, I uh, went into uh, jump school, then jump school went into uh, parachute rigging school. And then from there, it's uh, pretty much history. So I got tasked out with a bunch of units in uh, Camp Pendleton, California, and uh, got to do a lot of joint operations with um, 10th and 8th Mountain Group and the Special Forces uh, for it. And then also with MARSOC in uh, First Recon. So I had a were good you, Were you all in the U.S. or were you outside of the U.S.? So- uh, no, we, had, we definitely had missions outside the U.S. So I spent all of 2010 just about in uh, Afghanistan on deployment. Yeah. Yeah. 
Cool. Really cool. Um, question is where do I really want to go with this? But uh, I think that's, it's interesting. So a part of your journey, obviously was just like, okay, feeling that call on your heart to do some things that are more adventurous. Yeah. Yeah, totally. The call to adventure was definitely there. Yeah. Were you, uh, had you scratched that itch at all high school or younger, or was that something like, okay, now I'm out of school. Uh, I'm in the military. I'm seeing all these other guys doing more adventurous stuff. You're, you're focusing on your culinary arts. And, and that was that a part of the poll or has that always been on your heart since you were a little guy? Uh, uh, so since I was a little guy, I knew I wanted to be a Marine. I knew I wanted to go into the military um, for it. My grandfather essentially was like special operations in World War II. So he jumped um, with uh, in Normandy, essentially the 101st or the 82nd, no, the, the 82nd. Uh, jumping there and went into a bunch of different bold bunch of different battles there got purple heart got a silver star valor um, all that kind of stuff and my father is navy and my mom always jokes like man my my father had to be uh, army my husband's got to be navy my son's got to be a freaking marine (laughs) so i knew from early on i was like all right i want to go into the military i want to serve um and that was being essentially i remember it to this day I was playing uh, Medal of Honor Allied Assault, which was an old school um, PC first person shooter game, you know, and you're going running around kind of like Call of Duty is, you know, for it. And uh, that took place. I was like, man, this is what I want to do. And that's when I was like, All right, I want to be a Marine. I saw what it was, the few, the proud, that dress blue uniform with the white cap, you know, and I was like, that's it right there. That's the panty dropper. So... <laughs> I love yeah. it, love it, love it, love it. So, so ultimately, then you spent a year in Afghanistan, as well as probably mm-hmm. other places, you know, around the mm-hmm. world. But uh, what was that experience like? Were you, was that uh, mostly fascinating and fun? Was it traumatic? Was it uh, all the above? What was that like serving over in Afghanistan? Uh, all the above, man. In all honesty, there is um, definitely some PTSD that came from it. Um, there is some hardships definitely came out of it. Uh, but overall, man, I look back at it and I'm like, I'm so thankful I went because um, I look at it as this way is that I have a one up kind of on a lot of people because they a lot of people haven't truly seen war. They haven't seen what the human body, the human persona, who the who the human being is, you know, they haven't seen someone really die or get shot or have, um, you know, a knife be brought across someone's throat and cutting their head off you know, type stuff right in front of them and just for helping people out. So there's a lot of atrocities that are at war, but there's a lot of things that you can actually take out of it and actually learn, you know, really heavily from it and really appreciate life. If you don't mind me asking and you don't have to answer, obviously, but what, what were some of the more difficult things that you experienced over there that gave you some PTSD? Oh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Um, no, that's perfectly fine. You can ask. Um, fine. We'll talk about it now, you know, for it. Years ago, I wouldn't have been able to, but uh, probably seeing a guy's, um, his head get cut off uh, from an LPLP. So that's a listening post, observation post. Uh, It was set out onto a village and it was a village elder that essentially um, he helped helped a lot of the coalition forces out and we could just watch from afar and literally seeing this guy's head just getting cut off from you know the insurgents that are over there just for helping us out just being a good person this guy um was killed so and that 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 was probably one of the harder things to see harder things to deal with and then uh probably having an rpg hit our uh our helicopters too so oh shit while you were mid-flight yeah mid-flight on a resupply mission so yeah And, and you were on the helicopter correct yeah, we were on the helicopter, RPG hit, I actually um, could feel the pop happen underneath my foot, you know, from when it hit. Fortunate enough, it didn't explode. So I'm oh, still here today because of that. So the helicopter did not go down, anything else, but we went into evasive action. The helicopter, were, you know, two of them here. So flagship here, then all of a sudden gunship are actually that way, you know, for it. And RPG comes up and hits this helicopter here. And then this one here, that's the gunship. It just starts laying down on the fire while we're flying back and forth doing one of these, you know, evasive maneuvers, you know, so out of nowhere, boom, pop. And then you just go left and right. And the helicopter's like, boom, this way. All right, cool. And this way. And that's the evasive maneuvers that a helicopter does. Mm -hmm. But I got to imagine at least emotionally, 
that's certainly got to fuck with you because it's like like roll the dice the the rpg didn't didn't detonate right oh, if I had totally. it mm-hmm. it could have been the end and like how where does that take your thought and your emotions when you're like oh that could have been the end of me you know no uh, totally dude it puts a point of like abundance and gratitude like instantly it's like yeah holy shit like that was eight and a half to 12 inches away from our fuel pod so when we landed they our staff sergeant got out looked underneath pulled the rpg and the piece of shrapnel out of the bird and literally he's like that was right next to the fuel pod like if it would have hit that like the whole entire bird would have just incinerated right then and there there would have been nothing left because it's that close to the fuel pod so it definitely gives me a point of being like all right live your life to the full success you can but also be so grateful for the death because like in that moment there's a death to myself of not appreciating life and not appreciating death in itself too so that's for me i was like that was the the pinnacle moment that i was like all right time to really change some things and you know as life goes on we fall back into some stuff and come back out so sure sure but yeah almost like you said like the 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 man who maybe took more for granted than he should that guy died in that moment right Mm -hmm. totally Uh, and and what was birthed out of that was you being a lot more present maybe and and grateful for everything you got like the the breath that's being taken in and out of your your chest right exactly yeah yeah damn damn uh and then and then the the guy that you saw literally lose his head what what thoughts went through your mind after you kind of replayed that over the moments and days and weeks because like you said it's like a guy that was just out of the kindness of his heart doing what he felt mm-hmm. was right and he get he got the the full-on you know uh, to, to leave a family if he had that of course he had loved one like yeah, yeah totally mess around with your head um that is one of the reasons why probably i got out of the marine corps uh, was because we could not go back in and the units that were there could not go back in and take the guys out that did it, you know? So ROE in that aspect, uh, rules of engagement dictated that I was like, you're, you're not allowed to engage them because one, we don't have PID, which is positive identification of the person that did it. And then on top of that, just, you know, the good, um, the, should I say the evil prevailed because good men did nothing you know, for a good man that was helping us out. So that's probably one of the, the bigger reasons why, um, besides of medical disability, stuff like that, um, is the reason why I got out. So it definitely messed with me quite a bit, you know, afterwards. And it probably wasn't until I'd say 2014, 15 or 16 is when um, I really extrapolated and worked through a lot of that stuff too. Do you work through that stuff on your own or do you have a therapist or a coach or? Uh, all the above, dude. Um, I went to therapy just about twice a week um, from, let's see, 2012 uh, to 2014, 2015. One was in person and one was a teletherapy uh, for it. And then after that, it's been like monthly, you know, working through stuff. So, and even now, like I still go to a therapist just to talk through things. Yeah. 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 I wonder, I wonder if that, uh, that healing ever really stops, you know, but um yeah, I appreciate you kind of open up and about it. I think that's it can certainly be a a mind fuck, especially if you you know have a a good upbringing and you know nothing really you know like you said haven't ever really experienced war or death, and then all of a sudden you're high school or shortly thereafter, you know you're experiencing some really really heavy emotionally heavy experiences. I can only imagine. You know. Yeah, totally, dude. So, like in high school, I was bullied a little bit through uh, through high school and junior high. So I was like, all right, no, let go of that stuff, and then moving into the Marine Corps. And I definitely didn't have like a hard life, you know, kind of growing up or anything else. But man, did the Marine Corps really change a lot of things for me. So I'm I'm ever so grateful um, of my experience there. Getting into it is is the very first thing you go into is boot camp. Yeah. Yep. You go into boot camps, and that's uh, straight up thirteen weeks of hell. So the first phase is stripping you of everything that you know about yourself. So um, the Marines, we kind of coin it as stripping the the nasty civilian out of you. 
you know, so you're completely, you're told you're a worthless piece of shit. You don't amount to anything. You're not going to do anything, you know, for it. You, you don't deserve to be here to be part of us, be part of this brotherhood that is here, you know, and then once you get through first phase, now this is all culmination. So they're all done 13 weeks, you know, a week after week, after week, after week. And Sundays are the only day that you get to have a little bit of peace and quiet time. And that's because of religious services for Sunday. That's it. But other than that, it's go, 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 go. So first phase is the, the stripping away. Second phase is the formation and the building up of what it is to be a Marine. Um, so you learn a lot of like your basic rifle skills. You learn, um, you know, a lot of the history of the Marine Corps, you know, during first phase, second phase and third phase period and all throughout your Marine Corps career. But um, you learn the, the second phase is that and that's the outdoors, like the initiation into the, the wild, essentially, and how to uh, track as well as how to listen and observe and, um, you know, basically like wild man shit, you know, type stuff. Mm -hmm. And then third phase is the drill instructors, then you have a little bit more respect with the drill instructors that are there. And now they're teaching you how to truly be a Marine. And that is, all right, now we're getting you into the proper mannerisms, the how you hold yourself, the respect, the honor, the dignity, and the, the courage and commitment, you know, that truly takes place. Yeah, that of, of all the guys that uh, showed up on day one of, you know, boot camp, what percentage of them actually made it all the way through? Um, let's see. I'd say probably like, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I do know in my platoon and there was six, six platoons. No, it was uh, eight platoons, um, eight platoons total. And each platoon had roughly 80 to 90 guys in it or close. We started off, I think with like around a hundred dudes. Uh, and then we graduated out with, um, I think it was around 70 to 75, maybe. So, uh, I'd have to learn, like look back and look at the numbers for it, but yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's yeah, like, like 10 to 15% you know, attrition ratio, ratio. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, interesting. Because obviously I think you, I would go in kind of knowing too that you know, they, they just work to tear you down you know, and get you to quit, you know, mm -hmm. um, which part of that probably helps in refuting what they're telling you, you know, and screaming at you. But I got to believe oh, at yeah. some point it just gets so exhausting or relentless that you either start to believe it or – uh, it starts to crack you in some way who knows right but uh i mean you would know i don't know uh, <laughs> yeah it totally, it totally does but, man. no uh, you're, you're spot on bro yeah it, it is the resiliency yeah, yeah. and that determination that it really does crack you and if yeah, you don't yeah. if you don't get cracked on your own in other words you submit and you surrender down it's like all right i'm going to learn then you get broken and when you get mm -hmm. broken like then then that's when you know you either get recycled to another platoon coming back or you know you just become a freaking wretched asshole and there's guys that were like that in my platoon that they just toughed it all the way out they're like a bull in a shiny shop all right i'm just gonna boom barrel through everything and then when i get to the to the fleet i'm just gonna be the the worst freaking asshole i can be and just you know nose up in the air type of aspect too so there's a lot of those guys that are in there and there's a lot of guys too that go in that they're you know very soft and looking for camaraderie they're looking for initiation they're looking for that brotherhood um even higher so into it into a calling and they're the nerds you know of society essentially you know type thing and then they come out and they're like man like now i know who i am now i have an identity and i can associate that and become something better yeah i love that well taking that as a as a perfect kind of segue into the the men's lifestyle coaching you do the you know, the initiation processes that you've taken part in, <clears throat> how, how comparable has that been for some of the, the, the men's work that you've done outside of the military to what you experienced in the military? Are they similar? Are they not? Like, do you, do you feel like I'm asking you obviously a, a multitude of questions, but <laughs> is that kind of breaking down process, that initiation, something you feel like every man should go through? Um, um, I think that every man should, yeah, I think that every man should go through some level of initiation. Absolutely. Um, cause that a level of initiation then gives you your vision, your mission to accomplish something in life. Um, within the men's work, it definitely has a lot of pieces that tie into each other and, uh, doing the lifestyle coaching and archetype coaching, uh, for that too. It definitely ties in because the initiation big time and, um, 
old mythology was that uh, boys at a certain age, they were brought out and brought into, um, you know, their, their priests and their wisdom tribes essentially initiated. All right, now you're going to go live with these other men and learn what it is to be a, a king, warrior, and magician. And then, of course, a lover comes back, you know, for it. But uh, learning what it is to truly be a man and that initiation, I can see exactly like in the men's work that I help out with guys and where that initiation helps out from the military and to show them, hey, like there's this drive, there's this calling that you have to figure out first and foremost, once you figure out that calling, what it is that you're truly passionate about, then we start extrapolating it out further. Mm. Yeah, no, I feel you. <clears throat> so a big part of that for you, obviously, is, is having that connection, obviously, within yourself to understand that there is a calling on your heart, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you talked about earlier about adventure or yeah. um, that calling to, to be a leader, if, I, if at the very least of a leader of our own lives, right? Versus just kind of being told what to do or just falling in line, which is, there's a balance that obviously, in, I think in the military, you have to fall in line. You have to be a team player, right? You can't have everyone just leading and going off on their own. <clears throat> so sometimes being a good leader is being a, a good follower, so to speak. But what did yeah. you learn about leadership as it relates to the military or time afterwards or time before that? What have been some of the biggest leadership lessons that you've learned through your life um probably the one to shut the fuck up and listen so uh when i was younger i would always kind of interject and keep going and kind of have my own way you know with it and now it is uh the biggest lesson that i learned was discernment in that factor to just listen to people because when you actually went ahead and you listen especially in leadership you're like okay now i can hear and see what you're saying now I can see the reason why for some things, but at the same time, it's being able to have that, you know, that action in leadership and be like, all right, no, this is, we got to course correct this. So, um, I would say that and, uh, being able to observe the whole entire situation. Cause a lot of people, myself included in the past, even, you know, now I get trapped into this is looking to, you know, like real small in this aspect and just looking right into it and the, in the sniper scope, you know, that's all I see. And like, I got so much else that's going on around here. So it's, uh, essentially being able to train your mind to go on ahead and say, hold on, let me take a breath real quick and back up and come up to a 30,000 foot view to see the whole picture of what truly is going on and not just what I believe what is happening. So that's something I'm probably constantly working on even now to you today. And the biggest lesson that I also learned from the military to the men's coach that I have now is just freaking listening and taking my own emotional um, responses out of the situation to hear a person and then the own expectations, all that kind of stuff. Cause I think a lot of us, we get so trapped in, um, understanding all right well that's what happened but and i'm gonna judge it on that's what happened because that's my feeling about it hold on but that's not their truth mm -hmm. so it's being able to take out your truth out of the situation and then just hear so that that's definitely the biggest piece in leadership that i probably found in the past you know 15 years right so so genuinely listening uh to someone without listening uh through like the length of your own experience or your own interpretation, uh, yeah, which totally. is awfully difficult, which is it's really, really difficult. So difficult it's, at times. <laughs> yeah. But it's an art, you know, and I think it's uh, a really, a hugely kind of powerful asset to have, I think as a, as a human being, especially, mm -hmm. but, but even more so as we're talking about doing the, the men's work, being able to really listen and understand, um, yeah. Versus what I think most people do, which is they listen, they make up an interpretation really quickly, and then they're just kind of waiting for the person to stop talking so they can kind of chime in their, their take on something, you know, um, versus staying curious, which is what you mentioned earlier, which I think is a really, a really, really important uh, quality for men to, to bestow and to express is that curiosity. Yeah. Um, and I think that comes along with, with listening. So, yeah, I love that. I love that. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. So big part of the, if I heard you correctly, leadership skills you've learned is when to shut up and take Just it in. Listen and listen. take it in. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and also being able to see when you are being able to, to kind of bounce between uh, a very kind of um, what's the, what's the word? 
Oh, you can say a pinpoint view. Yeah, or yeah, like mono monopic, but a <laughs> very kind of like like you said a sharp shooter type vision where you have everything focused on just a little tiny thing versus stepping back, which I think about that as very masculine energy is that we focus on like the thing that we're really focusing on versus the yeah. more feminine, which is like actually opening up and looking at like what's the whole picture going on here, you know, and being able to yeah. dance between those two things. Cause you can't, you can't necessarily focus, can't figure out what you really need to focus on unless you have the grander scheme of things. Right. Yep, absolutely. You have the direction, then you can have the decisive action to actually go into it. Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. That's really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, let me ask you a little bit more of a, a vulnerable question. Mm-hmm. Um, just as a, as a human being, because I, you know, I know you, but I don't know you that well. I'm getting to know you, obviously, more and more each day. But uh, you certainly seem like you, you've got a lot of shit figured out in life. And yet, I think with the humility that you were talking about that we should all have, I think for me, the older I get, the more I realize uh, that I don't know it all <laughs> and, and grateful that I don't. So I'm, I'm curious to keep learning, but what's an area of your life that you're not necessarily pleased with that you're currently working on in 2022? Uh, one of the areas is um, diving deep into understanding, honestly. So um, what I mean by that is being able to, just like what I said earlier with, um, you know, taking yourself out from this kind of view into the bigger view. Mm -hmm. Um, It's the ability to really understand and have true empathy, essentially. Um, That's something I know that I need to work on. Um, It is in the association from other people to to myself to be able to identify with them. Um, That's probably my number one thing that I'm trying to work on this year is being able to be even more so of an empathetic uh, communicator, you know, with it. So, um, yeah, that's totally, that's totally it. So I think that's probably one, one of the bigger things that all men could spend a massive, I think if men had a greater level of compassion and empathy, like the world would be a completely different place. Um, so I honor that in you. I love that. But how do you go about doing that? If I were a guy and I didn't know, I'm like, okay, that sounds interesting, but, um, two questions for those that may not totally know what, how would you define empathy and how are you going about really cultivating that in, you know, this year, 2022? Um, the definition of empathy to me is the ability to associate your oneself with another person's story. Mm-hmm. So to be able to say, wow, like I can identify with that and I can feel that and not have expectations for it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that may be completely off from like the book, definition of empathy no, but I like what <laughs> it means know? to you though i think it's good yeah. yeah um and then the way to communicate it essentially and to work on it is by listening you know big time because i think for me um when i come up and i say or i interject in to certain things uh certain situations um or yeah interject into certain situations without fully thinking it through um, that's when I'm not empathizing with other people and be like, all right, well, all right, now I see what you mean by that because now I'm trying to mentally and physically just shut my brain off and shut my body off and just listen, you know, through it. So that's, that's what it is to me. And that's how I, you know, help out, um, others and be like, sometimes all you got to do is listen. And when you listen, then you're like, now you can actually really hear and listen to what the person is saying. And then once you listen to what the person is saying, you're like, wow, now I get it. That's mm-hmm. what it was. Mm-hmm. So one of those things for me that I'm actually working on actually is my, is the relationship with my sister, uh, my sister, Christian. So across the years, we've had a bunch of up and downs uh, with it. And we've had a, quite a bit of falling outs in all honesty. And that's because she has her beliefs and I have mine and um, we live life a little bit differently. Um, but I mean, she's my family. I still love her no matter what. And if she ever called on me, I'd, you know, absolutely I'd be like, Hey, I'll make it happen. I'll be there. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's probably the one that really checks me the hardest and is like, Micah, it's not about the nail or it's not about this, 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 and this. It's about, you didn't do this and you didn't hear me out. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You know? So she's the one I, I have daily conversations. I try to have daily conversations, should I say, uh, with her. And just check in with her, seeing how she's doing on her fitness journey and her nutritional journey, everything like that. And how she's feeling, especially with this whole COVID crap, you know, everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but yeah, she's probably the one that has helped me unbeknownst to her, um, achieve a much higher level of just being able to just shut the fuck up and listen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. I think the, in my experience, and this comes around to what you were just saying, um, diving into personal development, which I mean, becoming, becoming King's podcast for me is just about, uh, all of us as men, you know, journeying, journeying together and becoming better versions of ourselves, but ultimately moving towards that really imbibing more of that King energy, that King archetype. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but through the journey of personal development comes greater, true, greater, um, not true, greater, just true understanding as to why we do what we do as human beings, you know? And from that place, have I really grown and over the last like 13, 14, 15 years of really diving into personal growth, have I learned to have so much more empathy because now I understand, you know, oh, that person's not, they're not just being selfish. Selfish is just another word for fear. So they're actually just really, really scared even though it comes off as selfish. And then because of that, I understand I can have a lot more empathy for them rather than being, oh, that fucking asshole, they're so selfish, you know? And so right. I think that to your point is, you know, really leaning into to listen, to understand, not listen just to hear, you know, mm-hmm. gives you the capacity to understand, to understand where someone's coming from and allows you to have a uh, kind of a, a softer place to land, if you will, in your heart, right? And, come, and having compassion for them versus just assigning a meaning to something that pushes them further away. You know, instead you're talking about bringing them closer, which means healing your relationship with your sister or other family members or other friends. Cause yeah. obviously relationships with people is, that's where so much of the stress happens in totally life. You know? Yeah. 100% right? agree. Yeah. And pe- people misunderstand us or we misunderstand them and things get, you know, lost in translation over text or email or interactions. And he said, she said, I think a lot of it can be, uh, can be rectified if, if people can stay curious and stay empathetic to your point. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's powerful, man. I love that. I love that. Thank you for that, that answer. What, uh, another maybe <clears throat> challenging question a little bit, but, um, maybe this is the same answer. But uh, what's what's one of your deeper insecurities as a man? Yeah, totally. Uh, I got no problem answering that. Um, adequacy. So adequacy and abandonment, I think, are the two major fears that all men have. But those two, I've definitely had 100% mm-hmm. in the past. Mm-hmm. And I, it still creeps up into me even to today. So yeah. Um, yeah. abandonment probably because of previous relationships and them failing and um, them kind of honestly running away, you know, for it, but also myself kind of blocking it off, uh, because I also not wanting to get hurt. You know, that's a defense mechanism that totally comes up every now and then I'm like, Oh man, this is coming up again. Okay. How do I work through this and I have to rework it all, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it forces you down, um, into the abyss, into the cave, you know, it's like, ah, oh, here we go again. Let's, let's, let's freaking dive right in, you know, type thing. But that, and then, um, you know, for only a few actually, I got the sun in my eye here. Hold on. Um, <laughs> um, probably only a few people know, um, you know, other pieces of my past, but I've tried to kill myself twice in my life. Uh, one time was uh, before the Marines, and that was due to a fight with my sister, Christian, uh, that we had uh, at the time. And I actually tried to hang myself from my parents, um, uh, not my parents, but inside my parents' house in my room in my parents. Uh, with my father's Navy web belts and they're designed to only, you know, go together and they don't come apart essentially. So they only tighten up in order to loosen them. You have to tighten them further and come apart with them. So um, that, and then, yeah. So branching off on that. I mean, I I learned a lot through that and being able to extrapolate from it. So back to your question, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, those two go hand in hand. Obviously, if you if you have a fear, which I think you're right, we all we all have a fear of uh, not being enough, aka we feel or we fear we fear that we are inadequate. Yeah. Um, and if we're inadequate, then it makes sense too that <laughs> it would it would support a story that people are going to abandon me. <clears throat> they're not going to be there for me. Can't trust that they're going to be there for me because clearly I'm not enough. I'm inadequate. 
you know, so that's yeah. kind of a, a double-edged sword, you know? So yeah, I, I think, I think I, I feel those things regularly too, for sure. But I appreciate that. Those honest, those honest answers. I really do. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. What do you, uh, what do you stand for as a man in this one and only life? Mm, man, that's, that's a complex, a simply complex question, should I say. Um, yeah. One of my, <clears throat> I would say my biggest piece that I stand for is truth. Because um, in that instance that I tried to kill myself when I was younger, and then also later on, it was because I didn't know my truth. And it was bestowed upon me in that piece um, that I have a truth to speak and I'm a guardian of truth. So that's also what my company, Guardian USA, excuse me, uh, is all about. It is being a guardian of one's truth. And that is to the fullest extent to live your life to your truth. If that truth is um, something that is detrimental right now to you, that's still part of your truth because that's the path that you're on currently. If that truth is something that is very positive you know, in your life, then that's your truth. But it's being able to truly see everything that's going on around you and to focus in on that and then to extrapolate it out. So to me, the calling for me into being a man in that aspect is speaking one's truth. And that's the truest, authentic um, piece of authenticity that you can have, you know, because me personally in the past, I've gotten places to where like, I didn't speak my truth, you know, about it. I didn't, I wasn't my most authentic self. And it was completely detrimental to where I was at, at the time. I went through school of hard knocks. I mean, uh, I went through it, but really realized it's like, all right, you have to be truthful. You have to be in integrity. And once you are, then life just like, it gets very simple, not easy because easy has done something without much effort essentially, but things get simple, you know, for you in life. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. It's definitely challenging, but it's uh, simple, simple to understand sometimes challenging to actually implement. Right. Oh, so um, challenging. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it, it, it's yeah, a lot yeah. of work. <laughs> well, and, and I think too, if I were listening to this, uh, 10 years ago, uh, five years ago again, and, and I still struggle with my own sense of inadequacy and, and I hope at some point that, you know, most of that fades away, if not all of it, but, um, it's awfully challenging when you feel like you're inadequate, like you're not enough. It's awfully difficult to then speak your truth because your fear is that if you speak your truth, if you speak your needs, people aren't going to like you or accept you or yeah. love you. Right. Yep. Which then reinforces this fear of not being enough and not, you know, being inadequate and then they're going to abandon you. Right. Yeah. So I think that's uh, um, that falls yeah. in line. Yeah. That falls in line with the whole kind of nice guy approach, you know, which is why I think it's so important that men who are listening to this and, and women for that matter, who are listening and watching this um, do the work towards, becoming kings becoming queens it's like doing the work to become secure you know with oneself to where you know what you're not just knowing you're not going to make everyone happy you know yeah, totally you're gonna have to be okay with it right yeah so totally. mm -hmm. i think that's, that's a big part of it where where in your life in as we continue talking about like leadership have you um exercised your willingness to stand for truth stand for freedom even if it's not the popular opinion, you know, or you've had to, you've knowingly going to upset people, but that you've done it in a way that is in alignment with your core values, you know, has it come when you were leading in the, in the military? Was it when you were, you know, running your business or doing some of your consulting? How often does that show up for you? Um, to you standing your ground and, defend yeah standing your ground essentially for your truth um actually yeah. i had to do that in um a couple gosh what was it a couple of weeks ago um in my company that i work with right now and i had to stand up to you know our higher ups and tell them like hey like this isn't right this isn't the right way that you go about these things and without disclosing too much information here uh, with it, but it was um, a certain employee that had an issue with one of the higher ups, or should I say the higher up had an issue with one of the lower employees. And they um, essentially was really detrimental to the way they were talking. And that employee kind of came to me and asked for some guidance onto it. And afterwards, I had to stand up to, you know, the higher ups and be like, hey, like, you have to, you, you, that's not, 
that's not leadership and that's not, um, you know, being conducive to the company and the culture that's here. And that that's fucked up. And that was actually my words is like, that's fucked up that you said this, that's fucked up that you, um, conducted yourself this way. Cause everybody looks up to you, you know, mm-hmm. and that was probably one of the things in the past uh, couple of weeks that I had to do most recently, you know, with it too. So it was actually helping this other employee that she was just so, um, she was so beside herself. She was so hurt, you know, within it's like, man, like, I don't know what to do because this is, I'm doing the best I can, but I'm getting pulled in so many different directions and they're telling me to do this and do that and everything else. And so, yeah, that was probably when the last time that I had to really stand up for someone else's truth and, um, be the, be the defender of it and be the guardian. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. While speaking your own truth, obviously. Right. Oh, totally. So, yeah. Cause yeah. that's, that's my truth in itself is be like, all right, well, if someone comes to me and they're having an issue, then it's like, oh, okay, well I have to then help out, you know, for it. Cause that's, that's part of my core being is like, I right, I'm to be of service, you know, to another person and to help them out. And if I'm not helping them out, um, then it's like, Hey man, all right, well, let me figure out how to get you the right help that you need. And yeah. <laughs> I think that's pretty uh, relevant in today's world. I think there's a lot of people who are, um, without getting this to to politicize, but who are intent in uh, enforcing their truth on the people, other people's, you know, other people, even if that truth isn't true to them. You know what I mean? And so yeah. I think that, I think there's a big part of uh, of the virtues of particularly freedom here in the U S and across the world, just, you know, freedom for each and every single human being to choose how they want to live their life. That's being, um, you know, challenged right now. That can be Mm -hmm. kind of a, a, a a scary place to be in this world at times. If, if you're not in alignment with kind of the, the mainstream, you know, thought on different opinions, but I think it's, uh, it's cool that you practice what you preach, you know, and that you were Try to, man. back out for, yeah, yeah. Well, we're all, we're all human. We don't always, uh, we're not always a hundred percent in integrity. Right. But I think that's a big part of, of, uh, being, a an amazing human being. And, and, and particularly as we're talking about men's work, being, being a man is being in, in integrity with your word, you know? Um, and I, I certainly feel like that's, uh, something I've experienced with you thus far is that you're, very much focused on that and i think that comes a lot from your upbringing and probably your grandparents your parents your you know your time in the military and everything else so that's pretty appreciate that man pretty cool yeah yeah no it's awesome i love uh kind of what you stand for that truth i think that's really really cool um for those that are listening watching you know that maybe have struggled with or continue to struggle with uh ptsd you know or losing someone or um thought about you know, taking their own life or, um, or have a love totally on the other side of the spectrum, have a love for culinary arts or, or whatever. And they want to, uh, connect with you. What's, where's the best way to, to find you and catch up with what you're up to and everything else? Uh, just through Instagram essentially. So my Instagram okay. handle is uh, Micah.buck26. Um, that's the best way to get with me. Um, I check my messages on there, you know, every couple hours, you know, for it. And, yeah, that's probably the one that I'm most active on. My Facebook is just, that's such an old one. I'm like, nah, I'm good with that right now. <laughs> so yeah, that yeah. one. Instagram and then, is the yeah. best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Instagram's yeah. the place. And then, you know, if we got a good connection, you know, type thing, and someone's needing some help, you know, then it was like, here's my cell phone number. Go ahead and call me, text me anytime. I'm one of those that literally my cell phone is on almost 24 seven. And due to the work that I do and having global contracts with my current company that I deal with, so I can just about be reached 24 seven. That's cool. That's cool. Well, thank you, dude. Thank you for sharing your heart, uh, both in this podcast, but also with me earlier today in the coffee shop, as we geek out on crypto and all the other conversations we've had, I, I appreciate your leadership, um, in multiple areas, both for myself personally, and also for just the community that I've seen you, you know, really give your heart into. So thank you for walking the talk, man. I appreciate you. Thanks for being on. Hey, man, it's been an honor to be here, dude. So love the conversation, brother. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll catch up more soon, obviously. But uh, guys, gals, those of you that are listening and watching, uh, if anything that resonated with you from this episode, you want to reach out to, to Micah. Like you said, he's uh, just about as accessible as 
you can be. Uh, he's literally standing by his phone right now waiting for you to text him. <laughs> Because he will reply within 30 seconds. Uh, those are my <laughs> words, not his. But uh, yeah, check out Micah on Instagram. Um, and otherwise, we'll uh, catch up with you another episode of the Becoming Kings podcast. Micah, thank you, brother. Thank you, man. All right, guys, take care. Have a great one. We'll catch up with you on the next episode of the Becoming Kings podcast.